has, uh, has a new play that uh, Arts Emerson is going to premiere in October called Mala. Uh, and uh, we announced that on uh, Monday night at our season preview. And so uh, it just both shows happen to be um, by incredibly talented women and um, are about uh, family and home and Cuba uh, and uh, being uh, daughters of um, uh, immigrant parents. So, um, so anyway, I thought we could have a, a kind of a, you know, just a kind of an in-depth conversation about some of those themes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk with the, the two of you for a little bit, and then I'll open it up for some questions. Uh, we'll go until 5 o'clock, so it won't be a long conversation. And um, is that all, everybody good? Sound good? All right, excellent. And uh, I guess I wanted to start it off with uh, the two of you. Um, uh, we named this little conversation Claiming Your Space, and I was thinking about, uh, actually Kevin and I are um, thinking simultaneously right now, so we were both thinking about out in the lobby, that m idea, you've both written stories, uh, I know you both perform, and, um, and Melinda, certainly you write other plays than the kind of play that Mala is, um, and you, you, know, you, you have varied careers, but in these, the case of Daughter of a Cuban Revolutionary and Mala, these are both uh, very personal stories, um, very personal stories about um, your family life. And in, in that world of claiming your space, I guess the question that I was thinking about was, when do you know it's time to tell those kind of stories? Like, how do you know as an artist uh, that you're going to tell something so incredibly personal? And also, in both uh, the case of um, uh, Daughter of a Cuban Revolutionary and then Mala, Melinda is going to perform it. And so in both cases, you're performing these stories. And so you've had an instinct that these are not just stories that you needed to tell, but that you need to tell as actors as well as um, playwrights. Uh, so anyway, if, if you might, got either of you want to start uh, responding to that? <coughs> well, um, it, it's interesting because I um, didn't, I felt like I didn't have a choice. Um, uh, there's something in the play um, where I talk about seeing this person on this roof across from my apartment building, and he looks like my Uncle Ed Eddie, and it was the middle of the night, and he's waving a white handkerchief and waving at me, and I, you know, it was the strangest thing that ever happened. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, and then I was having all these dreams, and uh, so I, I really felt like I was um, uh, gently, <laughs> um, and sometimes not so gently, uh, being guided and saying, you have to tell this story. I felt, I felt very much moved by my ancestors to tell them. And uh, um, then I started a whole process with my family members, opening up some subjects and that it were very painful, and that was its own journey. But um, I think the point happened for me where I had no choice. I had to tell the story. That's mm -hmm. how it felt. Yeah, my experience is very similar um, to yours. I, I mean, I think in general writing, um, s uh, an idea or an image will infect my brain. For example, with Sonia Flew, I just kept turning over this idea of what would move a parent to give up their child, right? So I couldn't get that out of my head, and I was thinking in it. I couldn't get away from it. It was very interesting and compelling to me. With Mala... I feel like creating that was an act of desperation and survival. Um, I, you know, I, I, I have this over my desk, you know, this kind of credo where I try to write at least one true thing, you know, every day, every other day. Just write one thing that's true for me. And, um, you know, I was in a period of my life where every part of my life was completely out of control. Um, I, I mean, beyond my control, all I could do was try to survive. Uh, and in desperation, I would reach for my cell phone in the moments where I had 15 seconds and jot down a note on the cell phone. And at some point, I went back and I looked at this collection of, Wah! like, how, you know, cries of desperation, and I thought, oh, that's the story. And so Mala was born out of that, out of a really elemental need to express uh, the chaos that I was living in. And that's how the play, um, that 
not have a play to introduce. So the same thing. I I did not have a play. Um, it, it it's a kind of a survival mechanism for me. Um, uh, and I also think you you talked at the beginning about. I don't know why I made this note, right? The difference between writing something that you think is important. I'm going to write a play about something important. I'm going to pick an issue and write about it because it matters. And writing about something that's true for you, that's real for you, that's an experience that's profoundly, in, um, intensely yours, and having the faith that if you tell something true, it will resonate truthfully among people that you don't know and maybe that you have nothing in common with, right? Because I have faith that the human experience um, uh, 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 above all, all other things unites us. And so sometimes it's just about getting out of my own way and saying what I feel right now matters. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's also, I try to teach that when I, um, I teach playwriting and I say, you know, to my students, your voice is unique, and your voice needs to be in the world, like however that manifests, whether it's writing or singing or activism. So sorry, that's a long, that's a long uh, answer to a simple question. Yeah, but you're, you're getting to something interesting there, both of you, I think, and it's something that I, I think about uh, in both of your pieces. What draws me to them is both um, the unfamiliar and the familiar. So the unfamiliar being, I, you know, I don't have, ex I'm not Cuban, I don't have an experience of being a Cuban Im immigrant, so I'm interested in the things I don't know about um, the stories that you're telling. Um, I'm Italian, so sometimes I feel a little sense of simpatico <laughs> in uh, the, you know, what your mothers say to you. Um, but um, the, um, uh, but, but it, you know, so it's the unfamiliar, but then of course, I think you're both getting at these very universal themes simultaneously. And I just wonder about, for you as artists, that relationship between, you know, what's very specific to your experience and then how you're exploring these things that matter to all of us. And I think that's the beauty in both of the, you know, in, 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 your, in both of your work. Is there a question in there? I don't know, maybe it's just a <laughs> comment, but. <laughs> um, you know, we, we spoke briefly last night. Um, I saw the show last night and Marissa and I had a conversation and I was talking to, to you about um, how with your with your show this experience of um, um, uh, 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 of wanting to know your your lineage you know that your your show your play has so many layers it goes so far back you know to to the parents but also to the ancestors you talked about the ancestors and the you know the the, the gods um, who 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 watch over you um, and this uh, and 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 again. Um, the fact that it's particularly first generation immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, that seemed to me a very American thing, right? We talked a little bit about that. Like, I think in particular it's for this country, that's a story that we tell and retell a lot, like where our people are from, or you'll meet someone at a party and you'll say, where are your people from? I, that's a line I use a lot, you know, and they'll say, well, Poland via Mm -hmm. Afghanistan or you know I'm Persian but my mother was really Irish you know or they, everyone's got their origin story and I feel like um, that's also very specific to the place where we live like I don't think they do that in Sweden mm -hmm. I don't think they do that in places where everyone is the same you know it's where it's very homogenous mm -hmm. a very homogenous mm -hmm. population yep. so it may also again be like the specific the specific a conversation that's specific to us as Americans, um, you know, and I think that's also something else to, to look at when we talk about these. And then, right, wh what is America? What were we, and what are we becoming? I think this um, this thing of remembering is really important. We were just talking in the lobby a little bit that, um, I mean, partly uh, my impetus for for writing the piece was to claim my father's place in Cuban history, somebody mm -hmm. who had been erased, um, and also to discover, you know, uh, a, something about my own self, right? About what w we understand who we are by knowing what we come from, I think. And um, the Greek goddess of uh, the arts is also the goddess of memory, Mnemosyne. 
And I think that's really important. There are things that we are tasked to do as artists, to remember things that are uncomfortable for the culture, um, that maybe the culture wants to pour concrete over. <laughs> um, and I think that's partly the friction sometimes, you know, both for ourselves to dig into histories and memories and remembering things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really important. I, I think that's a, a, a certainly, I feel like that's a big part of our work. Uh, I yes, also just want to throw out there, Polly, I, I, I think it, it's really important to state, you know, the way you open this discussion about um, you saw the work and you said we're producing it. Like, that doesn't happen. No, no one does that. Um, um, for, for artists, for writers, for actors, it's, a, it's a, a, a gerbil wheel of years of development, right? Everyone wants to do a reading of your play. Everyone wants to talk to you about their play. You want, you want to have endless meetings about how your play could be better. But, but to have an organization, especially with the, like, these incredible facilities and this incredible visibility, this power, um, to say, yes, no, maybe in four seasons. I mean, right, it doesn't matter what we write. We're performers, it has to be seen, right? Plays have to be produced. They don't exist in the drawer. And so um, all of our great ideas and love and care and a activism doesn't matter without a producer who says, this voice needs to be heard now. Um, and if the producers are only listening to the same voices, um, the same race of performers, or the same uh, particular story, or the same socioeconomic, you know, comfortable uh, monologue, uh, um, audiences will, I, I think audiences will stop going to the theater. Um, uh, because they're, nothing is resonating with, or the same thing keeps resonating. It's like you don't hear the tone anymore because it's the same. Um, so I just want to say kudos to what you, you do, you and David and David and all of, um, all of you guys there. It, it's unbelievable as an artist to have a producer say, yes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. thank you. It was easy, it was easy. Um, the, yeah, I mean, and, and to that question about, I mean, just what stories get told, what stories get heard, I mean, I guess, you know, in what way for you as artists, um, and, and you both are experienced artists, so you've been around and you know, um, you, you, you have a history. As you think about that history, how, how is America changing? I mean, you both are talking about that. And how is it changing in the world of the stories that we're telling in the theater and other places? I mean, how do you, how do you see it evolving in your experience? Oh, uh, there's, uh, there's so much change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I mean, I, I think the change has been happening for a long time. <laughs> uh, I think there's a way in which um, voices that have been shut out are just kind of taking matters into their own hands yes. and mm -hmm. saying, we're doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly, I'm part of the Latino Theater Commons that was uh, in many ways birthed uh, in this room or the large gathering after the initial birth was in this room. So this is a very special room to perform in for me. Um, and you know, the, it very much is, yeah, we're, we're changing the narrative of the American theater, we're claiming our space, we're telling our stories, we are promoting each other, we are supporting each other, and we're finding those allies who say, yeah, your voices should be heard as well. Um, I mean, that's, that's really, that's really the, the, the big thing that's changed. I did a project um, around the, uh, during the last election, there was a, a lot of talk about um, traditional America um, being lost, and that really got my back up. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna do a piece about traditional America. And so I did a piece called the LA Founding Families, um, and a lot of people don't know that there were um, 44 uh, people who founded, men, women, and children that founded the city of LA, um, and, uh, 
all but two were what we would call today people of color. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was, uh, the other two were white Spaniards and then the rest were all uh, uh, Native American, African background, uh, uh, and then all the different um, uh, mixing. So, um, I mean, it, and it was one of those things where when, I t when we presented the piece, there were a lot of people who were like, whoa, I didn't know this, you know? And it's, so I think there's also something about revealing what's already there. Right. The change has happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and it's about really, st I feel like our, our communities of color are stepping forward and claiming that space and saying, yeah, we're here, we've been here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm, and I would also just add, I, I, I think at least we have finally arrived at the point where um, I, I think I can say no major American theater company will announce a season without women in it or without playwrights of color in it. Or if they do, the community's gonna raise holy hell. I mean, I think that that's something, right? Where it used to be not a, wasn't something even remarked on. I don't think, I think everyone understands they, they, they cannot do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, um, if only for the sake of all the bad publicity they will get. So I feel like the, um, as Marissa was saying, the community is so much more educated. Um, audiences are so much more educated about what they've been missing and um, making clear their demands um, on their local theaters, their producers, theaters that they subscribe, subscribe to and saying, this is not acceptable. Um, that sea change, although it may be, it, uh, it was too long coming and it's certainly not enough. It's by no means enough because for me, it, until there's 50, you know, until there's 50% women, um, in the season, I, I still have a problem with that. But, um, but it's, it's better. So, you know, we have to keep pushing in, in terms of our collective activism, both as, both as artists and as um, consumers of art. You know, I mean, so switching gears a little bit, but I, I keep circling around this um, question of, um, uh, and I'm thinking back about, uh, you know, your comments about being first generation immigrants and what story that is. And then I think about in your work, um, writing about home. Uh, and, and I just wonder about um, what is home for you as you keep exploring this. You know, I just had this very bizarre experience of coming back. I'm from a small town, a very conservative town in Indiana. And it's not home at all for me, um, but it's also home. It's such an odd, you know, like, so I'm, I'm always juggling how much it's not home and how much it is home simultaneously. And I, and I think about that in relationship to America versus Cuba versus, you know. Right. And so uh, uh, can you just talk about how you navigate that, um, both as artists, but just, um, you know, like how you emotionally navigate that subject of home? It's funny, because when I went to Cuba the first time, I thought, I'm gonna be home. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna feel at home. And I was so not at home, yeah. you know. It, it was like, wait a second, this is supposed to be home. Why didn't that happen? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've thought about this question a lot. And I, I realize um, uh, this room is home. <laughs> um, talking to you guys is home. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and what's great is I'll meet um, artists um, from different parts of the world and like there's a, when there's that, there's so much that we share. And I really feel like other artists <laughs> and, and that community um, uh, uh, who are working to create together that always feels like home to me like and that is I can find anywhere that's mm -hmm. I can go anywhere in the world and I can find those group of people who are you know making work mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um, I, I would I was think about so uh, I, I wrote a piece um, uh, this is the first piece I wrote which was also um, semi-autobiographical but a lot of a lot of material about my dad 
And um, in the play, sort of the culmination of the play, the line is, um, it's a privilege to grow up in the place where you were born mm -hmm. um, and to live a life, uh, uh, I'm misquoting myself, but, but right, <laughs> what, uh, like how, what an insane privilege is to grow old in the place where you were born, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like, think about it, who, who does that? Right? I mean, does it, has anyone in this room been able to do that? Um, it, you know, as Americans, we're nomadic. We're also people who, again, we're from, for, we're forced to move circumstances that are beyond our control or we choose a new home. And I just think about the great migration that's happening in Europe and, you know, what is home to the people in, from Syria? Like, what will, what will they look back on in us? in a generation or two. Mm. So, so I, I actually think that that question is really tied up in a question of privilege because it's only the really well-connected, successful, um, uh, I, I'd say financially stable people who get to grow old where they were born. Um, and, and, and I can't, I can't, like, just can't help rethinking that. Um, uh, given your family story and my family story, which is similar, the diaspora that so many of our generations have suffered. Um, and I just, I wonder, it, you just have to make home every day, right? Every day you have to make your home with what you have, the people around you, the, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I have a, a mixed feelings about it because I also, in terms of home having to do with a nation, mm -hmm. obviously I'm, I'm moving away from that, right? I, I, nationalism is very problematic for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up with, you know, um, and I, I'm sure Cubans are not the only culture, but they're the best at everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> Other Cubans think there's no one else that can make music, that can do this, that can do that. Maybe it's true about music, but um, <laughs> <laughs> and the food. sorry, had to do it. <laughs> but you know, th there's it's problematic, and I, I I also grew up in a household where my father referred to himself as a citizen of the world, mm -hmm. and I I like that. I like the idea of the citizen of the world. I kind of think the survival of the planet depends on us thinking that way, mm -hmm. um, and that. There's, there's something about making a new kind of home yeah. in community, you know, mm -hmm. in our extended community and communities um, that I, I, I like. I like that home doesn't have to be, although I love the earth and there's no question, I love Cuba. I loved being there. As, as soon as I leave, I wanna come back you know, I've been there five times, and I've been there twice this year, and I just keep like, I gotta go back, I gotta go back. Um, so yes, it does, the, the land of my ancestors has, has a pull, mm -hmm. you know, um, but home can be yeah. each day, I like that a lot. Um, another question that arises for me with, for both of you with your work, I, I, and I, um, I'm thinking about this a, a lot today, because I've been trying very much um, Stay, somehow to stay out of the world of politics right now. Like, I mean, you can't help but do it, but in some way I don't want to be mad all the time, so I've been trying, you know, to just not, you know, look too closely if I can help it. And then I, I sort of, I don't know, I kind of blew a gasket this morning, um, which I don't do very often after I read the paper. And, um, and I wonder about um, the way in which Cuba as a nation is just Political. I mean, you just say Cuba, and you're in such a charged political environment, um, and 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 part particularly in this country, uh, you say it. I mean, it's a very charged thing. And so, um, and and again, I'm back back to having been in Indiana the last couple of days with family. I mean, the way we get along is if we never speak of, you know, if, if you just cannot even mention po like. And if somebody says anything, everyone goes quiet and then they let the moment pass. Um, and so that's how we get along. And, and I wonder as artists, as you navigate, I mean, I know how hard it is to navigate it, you know, in a, in a, in a at home. How do you navigate it um, at, um, uh, you know, in the, in the work around, you know, family and Cuba and nation and home? 
I'm so always the upset. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm always, I mean, I, I, I actually find I'm always upset no matter wh which direction the conversation is going. And I think that has, you know, it, right, the complexity of the issue, blah, 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 oversimplification, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then there's this thing about what we think here, like, okay, American policy, yes, moving in the right direction, yes, and then this thing here about, there's always stuff that's, you're hanging on to from generations, and um, mm. uh, I, I'm, and I'm, I guess by nature a devil's advocate anyways, so I'm always on the wrong side of the argument. And I found, like, I, I guess I most clearly became aware of this when I, you know, I grew up in a house Cuban-American, so by nature, very conservative, very particular opinions, political opinions, and I was the, you know, Marxist, Marxist, you know, leaning communist, raging Democrat, blah, blah, blah. And I spent uh, a significant amount of time in Florida and Miami, and I came back, um, and, and, and so I'm used to that perception, and I came back from Miami, and suddenly the, this was right when Alien Gonzalez had been, you know, found mm -hmm. on a raft, and I came back, and all my American friends were like, "You should go back." You should. And I was like, "What do you mean? You don't know anything." And I, uh, the things that were coming out of my mouth were, <laughs> you know, as as far to the right as as, uh, you know, I, I thought, "Who are you? who are you?" And I had the same experience coming back from Cuba. So, and you know, anyone who comes up to me and says, "I'm so excited about," blah, blah, and I'm like, "Yes, but," that's what I'm. That's where I'm going. Everything for me about Cuba is yes, but. Mm -hmm. Everything. So I find it nearly impossible to talk about except on very personal, emotional terms. Mm -hmm. Policy, I can't. Mm -hmm. I was in Cuba, uh, both Miami and Cuba, during the Elian Gonzalez thing. Oh, God. And I learned something so important because in Miami, the news reports where Bruguera, who's a Cuban artist in Cuba right now, has started a, an Instituto de Artivism. And it's basically in La Habana, it's a, a space for creative um, exploration of what it is to be, to um, make work freely, right? Um, and collaborate. And I'm so interested in that. Um, when I was in Cuba uh, most recently, um, I was talking to somebody, uh, one of the workers in a hotel, and he heard that I was speaking Spanish, and, and he said, oh, where, oh, you know, where are you from, or what, what are you? And I said, I, I, I said, I'm soy Cubana, and, and he said, well, where do you live? And I said, the United States, and he said, you're not Cuban, no eres Cubana. And I, I, I looked at him and I said, si, sí, soy Cubana, mm -hmm. I am Cuban. And I think, you know, without getting into anything with the guy, you know, I just think it's important to kind of just assert gently, <laughs> um, let's, let's try and find a place to actually communicate, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's not gonna be easy. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with people who really make us angry. Um, but I don't know how we move forward otherwise, right. you know? I don't, you know, wall building. <laughs> does not move us forward. Right. Communication moves us forward. Yeah. Um, I um, would love to let uh, anyone, I know there's some uh, folks who've been thinking about the play, and um, I would love to, um, if you have questions, would you mind, just so people can hear it, there's a little, there's a mic on each side. Uh, yeah, how about you go and then you go. How about we'll take turns. Um, love to hear your questions. Oh, great. Oh, yep. go I'll go, okay. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, yep. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, one, uh, I, as a first-generation immigrant myself, um, who's never been to my native country and, and just got a lot of negative messages growing up and a lot of prejudice about rejecting your native culture, yet invariably being inextricably intertwined in it and the whole dichotomy of being torn between two cultures, I'm just wondering, uh, my first part is, when was the turning point, the tipping point for both of you as far as really delving into your heritage and your culture? Um, was it in, 
in the case of Marissa, the death of your father or the, de uh, the death of your uncle or just, I mean, was it just a coming of age thing, reaching a certain age, reaching a certain point of self-acceptance? I don't know, I was just curious, like, if there was a, a particular moment that really made you go back, do the research, go back to your native country and things like that, because I've always had the curiosity myself, but I haven't had that tipping point, that's why I was curious. Mm -hmm. And the second part of my question is, you both have chosen to do one-person plays, and I'm wondering if you thought about, at any point, about doing conventional play where you would have actors playing your mother, your father, different family members, as opposed to just making it you on stage the whole time, and, and what, was a thought process or decision into making it strictly a one-person show? Uh, I'll just jump in by saying, I mean, I, I've written, I have written m m many multi-character plays, um, and generally, usually people come backstage and they're like, oh, was that your story? Um, so it, you, get, you get conflated no matter what you do. Um, um, you know, my, my multi-character plays are not autobiographical in any way. They're just stuff that I'm interested in, but people, audiences tend to, they like to think it's a very, you know, it's more authentic if, if it's all true. Um, so I don't know what, I don't want me to generalize about audiences. Um, so uh, um, I, uh, I guess the the closest moment I could come to identifying um, what you're sort of putting your finger on is, um, uh, you know, I was an actress for many years, I'm still an actress, um, and I was living in Minneapolis uh, in the mid-90s when the new play development scene was getting very um, exciting, lots of new plays all the time, and um, I was doing a lot of play readings where you would come in, read a new play, and then talk about it and say, this is really exciting, I was confused here. You know, it was part of a conversation. And um, I came home one night after a reading and I thought, I'm really enjoying helping someone else develop their artistic vision. And it was really just like a light went on and I thought, do I have an artistic vision? So I just started writing whatever I was interested in. I didn't know if I was writing fiction, I didn't know if I was writing poetry, I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought, I'll just write down some family stories, and then I wrote down conversations I remembered, and then I wrote down a funny thing. Um, and I amassed a pile of paper, and I looked at them, and I realized everything was about Cuba. Having never really given it much thought, everything that I was moved to write about was all linked by that theme. And, uh, and again, that was another aha. So, and someone else has said it better, but it's something like this, right? I, I read what I wrote to know what I think and not the other way around. Um, uh, I recognize that that was my pool of inspiration. Um, n not that I thought it would be interesting for anyone else, but that it was interesting to me. I had something very similar. Um, I, I was, um, I'd worked for many years as an actress. I was living in New York. And um, I remember distinctly one, my, my husband, who's a theater director, an opera director, he uh, was um, writing a grant proposal for a project. And I said, oh, that's so cool, you know, you're like getting your work done. And, you know, and he turned to me, he goes, well, you could do that. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I was in my, my 20s, and I, uh, late 20s, and I thought, yeah. I could, and he's like, well, what's, what story, what would you want to make something about? And immediately, and it kind of was, took me to, by surprise, oh, something about my uncle. Mm. And I kind of went, what, really? Mm. Oh, yeah, that is. And then I just kind of like followed that line. Um, yeah, there, there's something about, uh, it's one of the reasons why I, as a, I teach at California Institute of the Arts in the grad and undergrad programs, and. Uh, it's something that I do immediately with my students is get them to start making their own work. You know, they write missions and we do personal artistic strategic planning and that whole process of really just asking yourself, what's important to me? You know, what are those things that I value? What are the stories that aren't being told that I want to hear told? What do I feel passionate about? Those, qu those questions are really important. And if you just take, you, you know, nobody can answer that for you, right? You gotta take that time and space to really be with yourself 
and ask those questions and see what emerges. And what emerges could be a surprise, right? Hi, I have a comment and then a question. Um, you had uh, talked a little bit about home and having money to go make wherever you are home. Um, it's been my experience that usually gentrification or whatever, you don't have a choice. You don't have the money to stay, hence you have to move. But my question has to do with the internet, mind control. Uh, you had talked a little bit about uh, the news here versus the news in Cuba. Um, and with the internet kind of making the world kind of one place and totally accessible, how do you see your place changing or maybe videoing and going on the internet or how do you see that working? Can I take the first part and maybe? I just wanna clarify, so my um, comment about home was actually more geared towards you can only afford to stay where you were born if you have money. It's it's so often people without options, without choice, who get swept away in movements. And like, as you said, gentrified neighborhoods sprout up around you that you can't afford to stay in. So I think, I think it's an incredible luxury to be that person who gets to say, oh yeah, I was born right here in this house. This is where I grew up in this, you know. Um, I, I think that's the luxury. Um, and so many of us are just trying to, you know, just trying to keep keep ground under our feet, never mind, you know, this idea of what a home is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just, I wanted to, to make that clear, um, that I, I, I don't think of money buying you other homes. I think of, of money and privilege keeping you where you were, where mm -hmm. you come from. Um, but you want to touch on the uh, internet question? Yeah, I, uh, my parents each had two jobs and we moved nine times by the time I was in high school. Uh, and so part of that was you just, you know, it got too, ex too expensive to stay. Um, so I think that was also an, a reason, um, when I talk about traveling, and, and I'm in a privileged position because my work will take me somewhere to be able to, you know, um, to do a play in, in Scotland or something like that. Um, uh, so that, that there's definitely, you know, a privilege there. But the, the home thing is um, the people that I can meet, even, you know, from different parts of the world here that I connect with. Um, but what was the second part of your question? The second part of the question had to do with you talking a little bit about uh, the commercials or the news in here oh, yeah. versus Cuba and having being controlled or having the public uh, opinion controlled, how do you see your plays, say, using the internet or combating that? It's the internet is just starting to get to the island. It's, um, but I think it's a little bit like, you know, if it opens a crack. I mean, when I was there last, and you were there more recently, but, um, you know, in order for a tourist to access the internet, you have to go down to the lobby and you pay a fee and you get a number and there's a special code and you can access it for two hours. Like it's very controlled, you know. Um, that's not gonna last much longer, you know. I'm sorry, even here in the States, what you see is controlled by pretty much nine media centers and companies. So how do you, and they mold public yeah. opinion. So how do you see arts, be it, and it doesn't have to be the internet, I just use that as, as an example, combating that and unifying that? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, uh, yeah, it, that's clear. Uh, 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 I don't think it can. Um, I don't think, and not in a, I mean, it can't compete on, it doesn't have the bandwidth. I mean, our plays will reach 100 people in an evening, you know. That's, that's not gonna, that's not gonna threaten Rupert Murdoch's empire. That's not gonna threaten the Castro regime's line on, you know, what happened in Havana today. Uh, but um, I think it's all we can do, which is, talk and tell the truth and um, you know I'm skeptical of everything I read and hear I'm skeptical of everything I see I'm skeptical 
I mean, I think that that's our only power. Um, uh, so I don't know. I'm. I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think a play can compete with uh, with a cat video, seen by millions and millions of people. I, you know, uh, but I don't despair. Um, and uh, you know, and maybe your question about how it, how open how opening the relationship might change my work. I don't know, but I expect it will change my work. So I guess I can say that it's going to change my work um, somehow. Question over there. That is such an important question, and it's something I was part of a delegation of theater artists that went to Cuba in October, and that was something we, we you know, it's not true in the Cuban dance community. It's not true in the Cuban music community or visual art. Why theater? Uh, and honestly, I'm, uh, it's something that I'm really interested in and, and want to have conversations in Cuba and with Cubans about, but for some reason, uh, theater, ha you know, it's it's deplorable the representation. I mean, there is none, you know. And I, I saw a f several plays there during the festival. I, it was really shocking. And those of us in that were on that delegation all had the same response: like, what's going on? I isn't a lot of the theater state controlled? Or it, I it's mean, all it's all state controlled. Um, so perhaps there's some relationship there. I'm, I'm guessing. No, but it's a very important question. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would just offer up that any, any, anything that is controlled from the top down, whether it's business or the arts or theater, anything that comes from the top down with a mandate of what it should be is doomed to uh, uh, fall into a cycle of perpetuating the same errors of you know the past. So it's the I don't I don't have any experience with Cuban theater. Yeah. I did not see it. I mean, I know. I I know that this is you know I I don't know the the answer to that or I do know that there um, are Afro-Cuban uh, artists who visual artists. There's um I I can't remember her name right now, but there's an Afro-Cuban visual artist who did a whole thing on beauty, and hair. Um, uh, in uh, for the Biennale uh, this past year, the, the year that I was there, I, I met her. Um, so there are artists in other areas that I met who are grappling with that issue, but I didn't see it in theater yet. I haven't seen it in theater yet. Sorry. 
there, was there another question over here? Or no, okay, I thought, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead and make comment and question. I see a question coming up behind, whoever wants to, yeah. I just had a comment, um, I don't know who said it, but I thought it was great that you went to see the play in LA and you immediately brought it here and brought it for us to see. Um, the last year and a half, I've come to Art Emerson on a number of occasions and the plays that, that I've seen here have just been phenomenal. I just wanna thank you for yeah. seeing it and bringing it here. Oh, thank you so much, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm also with the Play Reading uh, Club from Newton, and I r so I read your play actually a couple times before coming in today. So, um, and at some point, you're saying that you're the radio or a radio, and I I just checked my notes and I translated to myself. Well, she's a transmitter. So the question of mine is that me as a, as a receptor, what you actually wanted to deliver or what. How what you wanted me to hear today. And I want to ask this question first of uh, Melissa, actually, because you said that you saw it yesterday, mm -hmm. the play, and you're a Cuban or a Cuban-American or whatever. Let's not go into <laughs> details, but uh, wh whatever you feel about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I want to know what you learned yesterday about revolutionaries, or anything new to you? Yeah. Was there something new politically, emotionally, I understand. So I would rather wanted to have, uh, uh, I don't know, historical kind of information. Uh, but yeah. it's a question for both of you. So, but if you could start, if Melissa could start with her impression of yesterday and learning, and then just what, it, what you wanted me to hear. Thank you. So um, thank you, that's a great question. Um, uh, uh, my, uh, I feel like I know a lot about Cuban history. I've just been always very interested in it. I do a lot of reading about it. I pick a period and I get to know things about it. And I've also learned a lot from my parents. Um, and um, the thing that I always learned about the revolution was, that, you know, oh, well, everyone supported the revolution at the beginning. That was sort of, that's like the party line for almost anyone you ask. Well, everyone supported it at the beginning. Um, and then later, it, you know. But I never understood the pieces of it. Like, I didn't know about, um, Eddie Chivas. Um, 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 I didn't know about this, pan, you know, this family legacy. I had heard. I kn I knew very vaguely about the suicide, um, but I got I got so much more clarity on the timeline and the trajectory of how it went bad, how things fell apart, the size of the hope of a democracy, of free speech, of you know the right to vote, um, and how it all came crashing down, and so quickly. Um, so there was a bunch of factual stuff in there. But for me, and Marissa, I haven't talked to you about this, but I felt like the thing that grabbed me the most was this unfinished line you had where, I think maybe it was right after the man in white, and you were, I think you were over here and you were saying, but is it my fault that I'm like you were drawing a par very direct parallel between you and your uncle. And there was something about his suicide and it was implying something about you and, and your worldview. And, and I was so moved by that. It felt like underneath it there was this, right, this constant question of like, why am, I, why, why am I different? Why do I feel too much? Why do I do things? in a way that people say I should, you know, these questions that are always sort of under the surface for so many of us. And for me, the play really grabbed me there because it wasn't a line to your dad. It was a line to your uncle. And this, like, you talk about this gnawing desire to know this man who's unknowable to you. Um, and, and I was really struck by how theater can make those connections so apparent so quickly. Um, and so viscerally. So uh, I, I, what I got there was that it's, it's, it, it's really always about like, who, how did I get to be this soul? And mm. so I don't know, that, that was what, um, that, that through all the politics and through all the facts and through all the history and through all the longing, ultimately what, you're, what we're longing to know is the only thing we can know, which is this, right? And trying to answer those questions, to get other people to tell us, why am I like you? Why am I not like you? How am I different? How am I the same? Um, mm -hmm. 
that's what really what just moved me so so much. Um, I think uh, I'm very interested in um, again claiming my father's place. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of assumptions. I feel like the the revolution was hijacked, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and everybody knows one person, maybe now two, and they're both Castros. <laughs> right. um, and there were a lot of people. There were a lot of people right. um, that made that revolution happen and a lot of people in the story of Cuba um, that aren't, people don't know about. And so that's really important to me that I'm sharing, you know, this story about this figure who was really important who happened to be my uncle um, and, and my father and of course my mom. <laughs> uh, that I, so ch sharing stories that aren't heard uh, about Cuba, that aren't heard about are, is that's really important to me. And then I, I, on a deeper level, like I also had to put that in that list of things that I'm a daughter of, you know, I'm the daughter whose deep roots travel far beyond homeland and geographical borders. And, you know, I, I wanna reach p people and uh, I want you to be inspired to know more about what you come from and, and how those voices who have been before you have affected you, you know. Um, I think th both those things are really important to me, the specific about my family and then the, you know, I, I guess that's more spiritual, right? Mm -hmm. Of, you know, who are we? How do we get here? Like I have that line, you know, that moment when my father, you know, and that actually happened to him where he was taken and was told he was gonna be killed. And that moment of like, how did I get here? I think that's that's something. I think uh, you know whether we're conscious of it or not. We're often asking ourselves that. Certainly, at this point in my life, you know, I'm. How did I get here? <laughs> you know, um, it's a different horizon than it was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so those are all things that I'm interested in in sharing. Um. Yeah, so I just want to say um, we're going to wrap up in a, a, just a couple of final comments, which it, one is, um, you know, I, I think of that internet question and I think, well, you know, the only thing the only uh, thing to be done is to tell stories in these kind of pure, honest ways that you both do and, and to do it in the kind of intimate spaces that change lives. And so I just want to thank you for being artists who do that and give us those opportunities. And then I just wanted to say a final comment, which is that one of the things that interested us at Ars Emerson this year in terms of programming was um, we use the word Latino all the time, like it means one thing, um, and uh, that's so odd to me because it seems to mean many things. And so we um, uh, programmed very specifically at the end of the season um, a show from Santiago, Chile, um, a show that was, um, you know, a Cuban-American show, and then um, um, a Mexican-American uh, show, Premeditation Chicano show, uh, coming. Um, what date is that? Is it next week? Okay. Oh my God, it's actually next week. Um, so, um, and, and we, and, and on May, no, uh, no, actually May 10th, May 10th, which is somebody's birthday I know, um, is um, we're gonna do a, um, a conversation about the diversity inside of the Latino story, just at around that, you know, to be able to think um, more uh, deeply about, um, you know, what it means to say Latino in this day and age, right? Uh, in this moment in America. So. Uh, Thank you so much for sticking around, for being part of the book club, for uh, having the conversation. Thank both of you for being here today. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Yep.